Coming up on this edition of City Scene, prescription drug abuse and Casa Grande. We'll show you how to fight back. Plus, an update on economic development projects in Casa Grande, including Phoenix Mart. It all starts now on City Scene. Hi, my name is Mary Allen, Grants Coordinator with the City of Casa Grande, and your host for this show. Did you know that 70% of youth who abuse prescription drugs get them from family and friends? Here to share some tips on how to prevent prescription drug abuse is Cindy Shader, Executive Director of Casa Grande Alliance. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Mary. Let's talk about what Casa Grande Alliance is. Okay. The Casa Grande Alliance is a 40-member community-based drug prevention coalition. We've been around since 1989 and our mission is to develop partnerships and work together for the prevention of substance abuse and violence among youth and young adults. Now is your coalition just located here in Casa Grande or do you reach out? Uh, kind of both. The Casa Grande Alliance is focused only on Casa Grande but we also uh, we have a nonprofit called CGA Inc. that's the organizational arm and we do work um, locally with other coalitions we're part of the Pinal County Substance Abuse Council. Um, we also have members on statewide coalitions and, of course, national efforts. What is your collaboration efforts with the City of Casa Grande? I would say there's three ways that we collaborate for the most part. The first would be with the police department. Of course, the police department is responsible for uh, drug abuse prevention as well as crime prevention, so we have a shared mission in that way. And we do a lot of work with Crime Prevention Officer Thomas Anderson. We've been involved also with the graffiti abatement efforts that have been going on. We're concerned about graffiti, of course, because as our communities um, kind of look bad, if our neighborhoods look bad, then it provides a kind of fertile environment for substance abuse, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. The second um, organization or, or office within the city would be the fire department. We've done some training with emergency services personnel across the city working with Isabel Vasquez um, as the fire prevention officer. And then the third uh, office would be the magistrate. Uh, Judge Judy Ferguson um, has been working with us for several years on a diversion program for youth who are cited for underage drinking or possession of alcohol. Oh, and they have to go through a course through the... That's correct. Uh -huh. the, the kids are, have an opportunity to be diverted out of the court system, get a lesser fine, and if they choose to do that, then they also attend um, a class that we host on substance abuse prevention so that these young people understand the true risks involved with underage drinking and drug use. Now, part of your collaboration with the city is there's new medication boxes, disposal boxes, correct? That's correct. Now, those boxes are in both of the police departments at uh, the downtown station and the new station up on Val Vista. And it's very clear, they have a big sign on them that says medication disposal location. We're the third police department in Pinal County that has established those boxes. Is that a nationwide program? It is not a nationwide program, although uh, there are more and more police departments and communities that are doing it. Um, the, not everyone can take these prescriptions back. They have to go into the hands of a law enforcement officer. And so it's important that those boxes be at a police station. We have folks that they'll show up at a hospital or maybe a pharmacy and say, hey, I've got these extra meds, can I turn them in? And we just can't do that. The Drug Enforcement Administration prohibits uh, the possession of those prescriptions uh, except by law enforcement officers once they've already been prescribed and handed out. And why do we need to do that? Mary, as you said in your opening, 70% of the kids uh, who abuse prescription drugs get them from their family and friends. Now what that means is that a young person has very easy access to prescription medication. So we ask that families um, dispose of medications that they're no longer using, that they monitor the ones that they have in their home, and that they secure them in their home. But once you're done with your meds, um, and as you know, many times we'll get a prescription for 30 pills and we only need five, and we have a tendency to hang on to things. 
So if we look under our kitchen, under our bathroom sink or in our kitchen cabinet, we'll find half bottles of this and that. And you're not just talking uh, narcotics or painkillers. Oh, everything. You're talking... Sure, everything from antibiotics to Viagra. Um, we just have a half a bottle of this and that, and we, some of them we're using, some of them we're not. So we want to get those uh, where young people cannot get a hold of them. We're finding that our, our teenagers will, um, not just our teens, but our young adults is also are abusing these prescription drugs at a very high rate. Are they taking the like high blood pressure pills, something that normally you wouldn't get high off? Absolutely. Um, the young people engage in risky behaviors, and they make choices based on um, the fun of it rather than the knowledge that goes along with it. So while you and I would not just take somebody's pill, they're willing to do that. Sometimes they take them and sell them. Sometimes they just take them to take them. Um, prescription drugs are the third drug of choice among our teenagers. So alcohol is the first drug of choice, then marijuana, and then prescriptions. And we find through the biannual survey that we do here, um, the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission does a survey, 12% of our uh, middle school and teenagers admit to abusing prescription drugs. And that's a 45% increase between 2006 and to 2010, a 45% increase in the number of teens that are abusing prescriptions. That's something we really need to be concerned about. That is a huge amount. It's a huge amount. And the, the teens think that prescriptions are safer than street drugs. They figure, well, it was prescribed by a doctor, and it's medicine, so how can it hurt me? But we know that that's just not true. Um, the truth is that, for example, heroin and OxyContin, which is a pain reliever, are basically the same drug. Um, one is made in a lab, OxyContin, of course, and heroin is a street drug, but it's still, they're both narcotics. In fact, increasingly, we're seeing that people who start using OxyContin legitimately for pain relief when they can no longer get it, they really like the way that that makes them feel, and they want to continue to feel that way if they begin to abuse that OxyContin, and they're switching over to heroin. So I'm not saying that taking pain medication for a legitimate pain is gonna turn you into a heroin addict, but I'm saying that when people begin to abuse OxyContin, which is a narcotic, and they wanna to continue to abuse that drug, and they can't get it, they're either gonna buy it on the street or they're gonna get it as heroin. And what about over-the-counter meds? Do you see an increase in usage among the youth? Absolutely, the, stati the statistics show us that uh, young people are abusing over-the-counter meds also, especially our middle school students. What we're most concerned about, Mary, is um, cold medications and cough medications. That dextromethorphan, uh, the cough medicine that has DXM on it, mm -hmm. or DX, um, Sudafed DX, that uh, is a very powerful um, chemical within that medication, and it gives you kind of that ooh feeling, and kids are abusing it. Instead of taking two tablespoons like they're supposed to, they're drinking like a half a bottle. They'll go to the dollar store and buy a bottle of cough syrup, and they drink a little beer, drink a little cough syrup, drink a little beer, and it's giving them this um, pretty significant intoxication. And do they get together like in groups or are they doing this just on their own? Both and. Um, many youth are exposed to medication abuse, whether it's over the counter or prescription medication abuse. They oftentimes have it happen in a party event. So they're at a party and somebody's, they're drinking and someone's passing around cough syrup. So it's, that's where they're exposed to it. If that child has, um, I won't say the addictive gene, but if, if they begin to like intoxication, they may well continue that behavior um, by themselves. I can remember an adult calling me and saying she was very concerned because she saw a teenager out in front of our local, one of our local stores, and he was quite intoxicated. And when he opened his backpack to, to show her, he had about four, bottles of, four empty bottles of cough syrup. So that morning, mm -hmm. he had spent the morning drinking cough syrup to get high. So it many times begins in a party environment. Um, kids will have what's called a farm party, and that's P-H-A-R-M party, where uh, we all agree that we'll come in with 10 pills. So I go visit my grandmother, and I get into her medicine cabinet, and I'm not going to take a whole bottle of pills, but I'm just going to take out a few. 
And if they look sort of like aspirin, I can put aspirin in there and she'll never know the difference. Right. So I take a few from grandma, I take a few from my mom, I go to my dad's med uh, his bedside table, take a few from him. So I show up at the party and I've got 10 pills and I throw them in a bowl. And you bring your 10 pills and my other friend brings their 10 pills and now we have a bowl with a, ma a mix of pills. And I take a pink one and an orange one and a blue one and I wash it down with a beer and see what happens. Wow, it's very scary to have an experience like that. Oh, sure, and then the kids certainly don't know what they've taken. So, right. And it's really a life-threatening circumstance. So we, we really want parents and other caregivers to, again, monitor what they have in their home, secure them in their home so they're not where young people can get to them. And I also think about, you know, uh, we don't know that this 22-year-old that's coming to work on your plumbing doesn't have the same problem. Right. So we want to make sure that it's safe for him and then destroy them. And again, we're back to the medication boxes. Um, all a person has to do is take those medicines, take your name off the bottle, scratch it out with a big marker or take the label off, come into the police department, open up that, that box, put them in there and you're done. Now there's a few things, Mary, that we can't put in that box. We don't put um, syringes and uh, inhalers or uh, liquids. But if someone comes down to the police department and, and sees that box, there's a little sign on the front of that that tells them what you can and cannot put in that box. And if you have some things that you can't put in the, the medication uh, turn-in box, there's a little list of places you can take it. Cindy, you mentioned you partner with the Casper Grand PD and the Casper Grand Fire Department. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Collaboration is the key, Mary. Um, the Casa Grande Alliance is a group of people who have a shared vision and when we have a shared vision and put all of our efforts together we can really make a difference. Um, the police department um, of course does enforcement and when you want to do drug abuse prevention it's uh, well, recovery, it's prevention, it's treatment and enforcement. Prevention alone won't do it, treatment alone won't do it, um, and enforcement won't do it, but together, those three working together, we really can make a huge difference. It's more of a comprehensive approach. Absolutely, absolutely, and those partnerships are what make it work. So we have a long-standing relationship and partnerships with Cass Grand uh, Police Department. We used to meet in their basement back in the old building, um, and, and that connection is really important. You know, our police officers are out there on the street every day, and they come in contact with the consequences of substance abuse. Uh, they come in contact with domestic violence and they come in contact with children who have been hurt and people who are in desperate situations because of drug abuse. And so their perspective and their help and our partnership with them is really key to success. We want to um, help reduce not only substance abuse but its consequences in our community and it's through partnerships we're able to get that done. Now you have other events coming up here in the near future. Yes, we try to do two drug turn-ins or medication turn-in events uh, each year. We just uh, we had one in October at Anti-Crime Night, again in collaboration with Cass Graham Police Department, who provides the officer to receive the medicines, um, and also in collaboration with Pinal County Attorney uh, James Walsh. Uh, there will be an event in March. The Cass Graham Police Department has Safety Day, and we'll have a turn-in that day also. Is there anything else you would like to add? Addiction is a preventable and treatable disease. And with help, everyone who's using any kind of drug can recover. Uh, we just want to help them get along that, that road to recovery. Cindy, thank you so much for coming on the show. You offered a lot of useful information today. Well, thank you, Mary. I really enjoyed being here, and we so much appreciate our partnerships with the City of Casa Grande. For more information about drug prevention, visit www.casagrandalliance.org or call 520 Eight three six five zero two two. It's time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk with Mayor Bob Jackson about economic development and the importance of shopping in Casa Grande. Stay tuned. In September 2010, renovation and construction of the Lencola Recreation Center was complete. This project included a much needed transformation of an existing facility, originally built in 1980. New construction included the addition of a full-size gymnasium, new lobby area, additional offices, storage, and new restrooms. The new gymnasium is the first and only gym owned by the city of Casa Grande. 
Since completion of this facility, a number of new programs are now available for Casa Grande residents, including line dancing classes for seniors, an expanded youth basketball program, pickleball open gym for senior adults, Wednesday morning fitness open gym for adults, and open gym programs in the evening for both adult basketball and volleyball programs. Since 1980, the Lincola Recreation Center has offered a free, supervised drop-in program, After School Kids Club for youth ages 5 to 17, during non-school hours, including Saturdays. The additional square footage and renovation has greatly enhanced this program, as well as also provided the opportunity to expand programming. Examples include Friday night teen nights, a computer lab with eight computer stations, and internet accessibility, and a dedicated space for arts and crafts. The addition of the gymnasium has also allowed expanded programming with sports-related activities during the after-school kids club, including basketball, kickball, dodgeball, volleyball, foursquare, flag football, relay races, pickleball, and much more. Youth dances have been added, as have dance classes and other special events. Since completion of this project, Casa Grande's After School Kids Club attendance has doubled and even tripled during certain programs. Please join the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association in presenting the Outstanding Facility Award for community of 25,000 to 100,000 residents to the City of Casa Grande, Lencola Recreation Center. Welcome back to City Scene. Economic development is vital in maintaining a healthy progressive community. And here in Casa Grande, it is a top priority. Joining me now to discuss current projects in Casa Grande is Mayor Bob Jackson. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you, Mary. Let's talk about what some of the projects are in Casa Grande right now. I think probably the biggest one that's on the horizon is the Phoenix Mart project. And it's probably one of the most misunderstood projects we've ever worked on. One of the reasons for that is that there's only really two other facilities like that in the world. There's one in Dubai and there's one in a small town outside of Shanghai. And I think a lot of people think that it's just a, another mall, and it really isn't. I mean, it's, it's really targeted at business-to-business -business commerce as opposed to typical retail commerce. The, the general model is an 800-square-foot module that specializes in some kind of product. And they have the ability then to showcase that product on an international scale to international buyers. The project's being developed by a company called AZ Sourcing out of Phoenix. They are the same people that did the Chinese Cultural Center up at 44th and uh, Van Buren, I think. Um, and I think they, 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 their intent is to try to help American small businesses market their products on an international platform. The uh, uh, center will be a million and a half square feet. It's a $150 million investment. The uh, investors, for the most part, uh, while there are investors from all over the world, the majority of them are Chinese citizens, and this is their personal wealth that they are investing in this facility. It's under an immigration program known as the EB-5 program that was started in the early 90s. And what it does is it allows uh, foreign nationals to obtain a green card if they can do job creation in a local community. You have to have an unemployment rate, 150% of the national average. And we were, had to work a little bit with some of the, the voter precincts to come up with a unemployment rate of 150% of, of the national average. But we were able to do that. And the result of that is the Phoenix Mart project. And where's the location of that? There's actually two phases to it. The, the first phase, which is scheduled to open up in January of 2012, is the Old Tanger Mall. One of the companies that uh, is one of the primary investors in the Phoenix Mart is a company that sells furnishings to high-end hotels, uh, four- and five-star hotels, on an international scale. They'll open up with about 60,000 square feet of space at the mall shortly after the first of the year and we'll start attracting buyers from around the world uh, to furnish four and five star hotels. The larger facility, a million and a half square feet, will be located out more or less on the northeast corner of Overfield Road and Florence Boulevard. And what's the benefit of bringing that to Casa Grande? Well, the primary benefit is that it will create 3,000 jobs in the local economy. And certainly people ask me all the time, what kind of jobs are they? And it's anything from assembly, uh, 
forklift drivers, delivery truck drivers, up to people that are multilingual that have the ability to uh, go around with foreign buyers, take an order, place the order, and uh, uh, is internet based as a company, most of them are internet based, and be able to make sure that that product gets delivered to the end location in a timely fashion. AZ Sourcing has already indicated that they want at least half of the square footage of the facility to be earmarked for U.S. products. And we are working with several Arizona based companies to see if we can get them into that international marketplace uh, and really enhance their business. Uh, we will see lots of visitors from around the world that will be coming into the community. Uh, probably means we're going to have to have more hotels, more restaurants, uh, more retail shopping opportunities because the people that come in are spending their day shopping for goods. For instance, there may be a, a group of businesses there that have nothing but women's purses. And you or I could go in and buy a purse, but that's not really their market. Their market is to have, say, a coach purse uh, buyer come in and find a purse that they like, tell the, the vendor, I need 10,000 of these within three months delivered to these locations and I want our Coast logo put on them. That's really what their business model is and, and I think there's been a lot, like I said, a lot of misconceptions about what they're doing. What other projects are going on in the near future? Well, I think that, that you know, the, the ones that are the most uh, talked about in the community uh, we are looking with Sam, working with Sam's Club. Uh, they're looking to go at the southeast corner of I-10 and Florence Boulevard. I think that they're probably going to get started within the next six or seven months. That's important because I think right now, if you look at the retail leakage that happens in our community, uh, we get a lot of people that go to Costco and Sam's Club up in the valley. And if we have a Sam's Club here, we can get a lot of that sales tax revenue staying here in the community. And I think that's important because so much of, of the city's income is based on sales tax. It really helps to have that money stay here. Uh, a second uh, project is the Ritchie Brothers Company. Ritchie Brothers is, a, uh, is the world's largest heavy equipment auctioneer. They'll have five auctions a year where they will bring in between 1,000 and 1,500 people to buy heavy equipment in a week-long auction huge sales tax component. I think the sales tax they estimate to be somewhere in the magnitude of 1.2 million dollars to the city of Casa wow. Grande. And again, because we're so sales tax dependent, it's a, a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to offer city services with that additional tax revenue. They're not a big employer. They employ about 25 or 30 people full time, but they, when they do their five auctions, they'll staff up to 150, 200. And more importantly, I think you're going to see some spin-off industries come out of that. Again, there's going to be a need for hotels, restaurants, retail space, which helps the local economy because this is new money that's not currently in Casa Grande. So we'll be able to hopefully build the ec local economy uh, one little step at a time. Well, there's been some recent businesses that have opened in Casa Grande. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Well, I think the, the most recent one is Joanne's. And you know, interestingly enough, uh, we had a report done about a year ago by a company called the Buxton Company, and they can trace uh, retail sales that come uh, from people that live in Casa Grande where they're spending it. And Joann's was one of the big uh, uh, retail companies that had a huge market here. What is the city doing to promote economic development in the city of Casa Grande? You know, for probably 20 years, we've belonged to the Central Arizona Economic Development Foundation. They're a regional group, includes Coolidge, Eloy, uh, Casa Grande, and Pinal County. And I think it's important that we kind of look at economic development on a regional basis because if a company, maybe we don't have the right building or the right land for a particular industry and they decide to go to Eloy or Coolidge. We know in Casa Grande that some percentage of the people that get those jobs are probably going to live here. We know some percentage of those people that uh, do get the jobs that don't live here are probably going to spend some of their money here. So again, that drives the local economy. So I think uh, first and foremost, keeping that regional perspective, being an active participant in, in Cardiff. Uh, we also belong to GPEC, which is the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. They're much like Cardiff, they're on a much bigger scale, 
and uh, they tend to get uh, prospects in from Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. And we've been fairly successful in getting some, some good leads from GPEC in terms of uh, potential industries it could locate down here. Uh, we also have a brand new website. Uh, it's called Think Big, Think Casa Grande. We also have a newsletter that we started, uh, and we have some fact sheets on uh, some of the new industries coming in, including the Phoenix Mart. So I would encourage people that, that are curious about it, get on the website, click on the link for the, the uh, city's economic development site, and see some of the things that we, we try to try to promote. I think that most economic development companies coming in, or most new companies coming in, they look first and foremost at the land availability. They're going to look at the workforce, what are they qualified to do, uh, how available are they, how expensive are they. They're going to look at, at infrastructure, you know, do you have adequate sewer, do you have adequate roads. And, and last but not least, I think a lot of them look at quality of life issues. You know, do you have a library system? Do you have a park system? Do you have open space? Because at the end of the day, that will be some of what sets you aside from the competition. And our competition in Arizona is Texas, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. We're well positioned. We seem to get more than our share of, of leads. Now, shopping locally, you mentioned that um, holidays are coming up. What's the benefits and why should we shop locally for the holidays? You, you know, uh, you think about who sponsors our little league teams, who gives money to local charities, be it the Boys and Girls Club, Against Abuse, whoever it is, they are the local businesses. And so for them to maintain a, a profitable business, they need to have local shop there. And the tax dollars get turned several times in the local economy. We absolutely need to shop local. Like I said, 55% of our general fund is sales tax revenue. So every time you go up to the valley and, and you know, buy a suit at, you know, Macy's instead of buying one at, at Dillard's, that's tax money that is going up to Maricopa County instead of down here. And every time a local ball team, for instance, decides that they need a sponsor for something, the first person they go to is the local businessman. That's why it's so important to keep those dollars local. How much of our budget impacts public safety? You know, public safe, safety represents two-thirds of our general fund budget, so 65%. Uh, and if 55% of it is sales tax revenue, that means every time you buy something locally, a, a big percentage of that goes back to help support the police and fire department for the city of Casa Grande. Thank you so much for coming on our show. You shared a lot of information about economic development that many of us probably don't pay attention to on a regular basis. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Certainly would encourage anybody who's interested in what's going on with the city to look at the city's website. Again, it's casagrandeaz.gov. Great resource of information, talks about all the things that are going on in the community. Get on the city's economic development website as well, which is, uh, there's a link from the, the city's website as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome, my pleasure. To sign up for our newsletter and learn more about economic development projects in Casa Grande, visit www.thinkcasagrande.com. Okay, here's your chance to win a Castor Grand gift bag. Each month on City Scene, we will ask you a question about the show and give you a chance to answer it for a prize. But first, we'd like to congratulate Wanda, last month's City Scene winner. Congratulations, Wanda. This month's City Scene question is, why is it important to shop locally? Submit your answer on our website, www.casagrandeaz.gov. Just look for the City Scene logo, and good luck. That wraps up this edition of City Scene. Be sure to tune in on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 11.30 a.m., and 7.30 p.m. right here on Channel 11. New episodes air the beginning of every month. I'm your host, Mary Allen. Thanks for watching. Remember, City Scene is your inside look at Casa Grande. See you next time.